Hello and you're very welcome to another edition of the JMI Podcast. I'm John Mann and of course this podcast is sponsored by YorkerRedShow.com. Use my promo code JMI Podcast to get 15% off on the website. And today I am joined by former Armagh player Justin McNulty to talk about the trials and tribulations of his um, illustrious Armagh career, the COVID situation, his career to date and his uh, management in the past. So a lot to fit in and really looking forward to today. So uh, Justin, how how's tricks with yourself? Great, thanks, John. Thank you very much for having me on. And I've never had my career described as illustrious. That's a new one, <laughs> but I'll take it. Thanks for that, John. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, your your medal hall is uh, is a lot more impressive than a lot of people I know, anyway. So uh, it's very very impressive stuff. And um, I suppose, uh, Justin, how's life with yourself? Uh, how how's tricks um, down down uh, down in the north? Yeah, it's it's just busy. It's um, I guess we're at, we're at the tail end of this pandemic and it's good news today and that the, the limit of uh, attending outdoor occasions events has been raised beyond 500 so, so I think it's going to be in line with the uh, um, health and safety risk plan so hopefully they get a bigger crowd than 500 into the athletic grounds on Sunday for the game against Antrim which is fantastic because it's such a release for people to be able to get out and support their team so really looking forward to that. Busy work ways obviously um, as an elected representative that's very demanding when people are being hit so hard in so many different ways from every walk of life because of the pandemic. Um, but we're not only here to talk about that, we're here to talk about GA and looking forward to having that, that bit of crack with you as well, John. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. That's what we're, that's what we're here to talk about. And I suppose, uh, Justin, obviously, yeah, as you were saying, we've been in basically this for nearly the last year and a half. So I suppose, obviously, work-wise, it, it's going well for yourself. And but I suppose, how, how, how's, how's it been for you, I suppose, Justin, personally? Obviously, has it has it changed your perspective on much stuff? I think it has to have changed everybody's perspective. Um, I think it's probably um, confirmed what's what's most important. And that is your health. Once you have your health, everything else is uh, insignificant, really. And I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my family's great health. I'm thankful for um, I'm not having lost anyone really close to me as an outcome of the pandemic. Um, I have more appreciation for the countryside, more appreciation for getting out into the Wales and um, enjoying the small things in life. And um, it's good to get back, though, meeting people, having having meeting somebody for a coffee, meeting somebody for a drink, uh, going out for a meal. It's good to get that back again and uh, just enjoying life as is. Yeah, yeah, definitely, hundred percent, hundred percent. And uh, I was watching a video there a few weeks ago where you you were going on about obviously numbers of wedding, and I think uh, you can't have a wedding without a booby, Justin. So if you want to confirm to the listeners what you're talking about, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think people, a lot of people, have been very frustrated with the, in the fact that they can't attend weddings. Number one, and number two, uh, they're allowed one dance. The couple, the married couple, are allowed one slow dance, and that's it. That was it, you know, for a large part of the pandemic, which is is crazy. Um, I think people are just itching to get out and let their hair down and have a bit of a boogie on the dance floor. So I was making the case for for um, wedding music to be permitted and dancing to be allowed. And I advocate strongly for wedding dancing, even though I'm the worst man on the dance floor. <laughs> two left feet on the dance floor. And I think people enjoy that that freedom on, on, on wedding days. And I think it's a good, good way to relax and release. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We can all be advocates for that. And of course, uh, Justin, we can uh, touch on to your career. Obviously, you um, have represented Armagh from 1995 to 2005 and obviously your club, uh, Mullock Bon. And you made your debut for the Armagh Senior Footballers against Loud in 1995 in a league game, Justin. So uh, not today or yesterday? Oh my gosh, just a long time ago. Um, <laughs> yes, I guess, I guess I made my debut off the back of a, of a strong... Um, Club campaign with Mullaban. Uh, Mullaban had a big, big year in '85 as well, um, and we we've been knocking the door at club level for a few years, and we went on in '85 when we went at Armagh Club. Uh, so probably based on that fact, I was selected by Brian McLean and Brian Calvin to join the Armagh panel, and incredibly, just a number of weeks after joining the panel and joining, the, getting into a group of players who, not long ago, not, not long beforehand, I was sitting idolising in the stands. And uh, getting to play alongside those guys was a dream come through. As a young guy, as a young boy, I think like all young boys, young girls, we dream about donning our county colours. And um, I'd done that at mayor level for a year um, as a substitute, would you believe, and um, not getting much game time in championship, or zero game time in championship as an Ireland mayor. Um, but to get to wear, wear the senior jersey was a dream come true. And I was, I was just um, 
fun, fun memories and um, nerve-wracking, uh, emotionally overwhelming even, and uh, but great, great support from players around me. And I can remember my debut in, in Drogheda and Mark and Ollie McDonald, and it was a tough game, tough game against Lowe's. I think we, we came out on top that day, but um, fun memories. Yeah, 100% absolutely. And I suppose it came, 1995 it came rocking around with Justin. Obviously, you were working extremely hard to get break, make a breakthrough to, onto the RMA panel as well, Justin. So, I suppose, obviously, with your brother end uh, playing as well, was this something that you always wanted to do, represent the RMA senior footballers to them, Justin? Um, definitely. Um, as a youngster, football was all that mattered. Nothing else mattered. Nothing, nothing got in the way of football. It wasn't focused in any other area of life. It wasn't focused academically. Um, and... Really, well, only happy when I get on the pitch with a shy young fella. I wouldn't open my mouth in class. I wouldn't say boo to anybody. But on the pitch, I cut loose and uh, was able to express <laughs> myself. And thankfully, I had a bit of um, talent about me. A bit, and it was very hardworking. And uh, thankfully, I had good players around me, and was able to make it onto the team based on the coaching that I received at underage level from you. Know, I can remember my first under 12 training session with the band with Charlie Grant, God rest him, you know, at school. Um, and so Malagis and Campbell, Master Cairns, uh, Master Freem. And coming to Buzz School was huge, you know, in terms of bringing players on at that age. I remember playing against Archie McConville at primary school level, would you believe? Malagie McGinney, who was involved with coming to Buzz School, organising trips to Cork, your first, first away holiday almost was a uh, Coming to Bun School trip to Cork, organised with Malachi McGinney. I remember staying in the house in Cork, in the old farmhouse in Cork, and our away, away game with our own lads over away weekends. And uh, Jared Dineen actually was the player, the, the Cork player I was matched up against, he used to be pen pals for year after, years afterwards. Um, so all my coaches all along who all played a part in my development, brother Ernest and Armand Meyers, Seamus Harvin, Liam McCarry, Val Keane, Jim McCartney, the Abbey. Um, my father played a huge role in terms of my development as a footballer and um, almost every match we ever played, and me and my brothers, my twin brother, my younger brother, Enda, uh, my other younger brother, Patrick, you know, so I think my dad's passion for the game was rubbed off on us from a very early age. We were at every RMA game when we were knee high and just very, very passionate supporters of RMA. My dad played for RMA as well and he was a passionate supporter of RMA and like many other um, and you know, many other people and families you know, we're just brought up with Arma in our in our blood, in our DNA, and we're very, very passionate about it. Yeah. I suppose just as well, how important is they say the influence from um, the elders, your your dad, your brothers kind of driving you on, I suppose. They obviously did make the make the player you were all them years ago, Justin. They all contributed, uh, certainly. Um my twin brother was was a great player. He actually my twin brother Paul, he actually played in the All Iron Minor final in um, 1982 when I, when I was a substitute. But he he focused more on his career thereafter, and um, whereas I kept kept the focus on football. Uh, he had the ability to go and play at senior and level, but he just didn't keep the that that drive there to keep going. Um, I think I think every player benefits from inter-family com competitiveness. So we were competitive within our own family, so we were always fighting over a ball in the backyard from a very young age with our neighbours and um, as well and our cousins and relations with a football field, a mini football field out the backyard with makeshift posts and makeshift nets and we were there every day in life and I think that's that's where uh, the great players uh, develop most in, in their own backyard and their own side of the house um, and the skills you learn there you know you, you take with you. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, and it makes everyone the player they are today, and uh, so on, and so forth. And I suppose uh, Justin to kind of um, reflect on obviously your accolades: five Ulster titles, one All Ireland title, one National League, one Armagh title, and one Ulster title. And um, five Ulster titles, Justin, in a very strong province over the years. Not bad going. Yeah, very, very fortunate to have played with good players under under strong management. Um, and there were many games we played in like that were. There's a kick of the ball in it, you know. So for us to have come out the right side of them, um, we have to be thankful for. Uh, we probably would have given up a few of those Ulsters to have come out in the right side of other games. Um, so I prefer to have the Sams rather than the Ulsters. Um, but at the same, same time, very, very thankful. And with some ding dong battles down the years, with Donegal down, uh, Trillin, of course, and uh, Monaghan and Cavan. You know, with great, great games from Anna, great games, great, great rivalries, great rivalry in Ulster, 
all through this last 25, 30, 40 years, as far as I can remember. And um, it's the most competitive province and uh, widely accepted. So, and it's just a really, really enjoyable competition to be involved in. And um, it's gone. I miss it. I miss the cut and thrust of those battles in Clonus. Uh, but you move on, you move on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose you can look back and then five old styles as well, um, Justin. And I suppose, what did you make of kind of playing back in the early noughties and probably uh, probably late nineties as well, Justin? Like, what what did you make of the style of play, the quality of football, and I suppose really enjoyable times for yourself and the Armagh senior footballers? Um, well, listen, it's a different sport, different sport than the game now. Um, much more open. Um, having played as a midfielder, played as a half forward, played as a half back, full back. I can remember much of my time in the full back line for our miles, spent screaming at players, give us cover, give us cover. You know? <laughs> Me and Enda inside on the wrong one on one with two players in the acres of space. You know, that was a tough, tough place to occupy. Um that doesn't happen nowadays. We're well, rarely maybe in a break ball, a break break game scenario. Um you know, the defensive systems now are much more uh, effective at at make it more difficult for teams to the opposition to score. Um but the, and I guess the skill levels are not probably as good, or not as good then as they are now. The skill levels now are supreme because the, the, the coaching of the young people, the, the players are getting nowadays from a very young age is exceptional. Um, and you know the skill levels of the Armagh team currently in every position is phenomenal. Um, I don't know if we had that necessarily in that day, in that at that time. Uh, the conditioning now is a different, different league, um, much more scientific, much more uh, sports focused. Um, and sports specific um, than what we were doing. You know, we were running up and down hills and laps and laps and laps, which was possibly counterproductive to the game and to the needs and the demands of the game. But uh, at the same time, there's a lot to be said for it. It built a steeliness within us. We 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 did many many uh, day dog uh, training sessions that, that would kill you, <laughs> but. Not very good for developing your athleticism, but definitely good for developing your speediness and your your determination and your resilience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose can you even touching on that as well, Justin? Obviously, we we hear so much these days about the training regimes and methods, and obviously a lot of people saying like it's it's like a full time job, no pay, the current uh, county system. But what did you make of that training back in the day, Justin? Obviously, you and yourself and end obviously seem like fitness fanatics and still are. But what did you make for that at the time, Justin? You obviously loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, listen, when you're going out on the pitch, when you know there's a, a killer session coming up, you, you don't look forward. You, you, you um, and dread, and dread, and we knew that many nights going to training, you just, you be easier to stay at home and say, listen, couldn't, couldn't be bothered doing that. But that, but that wasn't within the makeup of the players I played with, and they all stood up. And that was a club level with Mother Band. Some of the sessions we did were scary on the beach, you know, in, in Caroni Park or on, on the side of Steve Gullion. Other people down it was just uh, it was um I'm, I'm getting pains now thinking about it you know it was extraordinarily tough training sessions uh, but built built a big time uh, reserve of uh, stamina in, in our uh, athletic tanks um and the same with our Brian Brian McLennan probably came in and Brownie Calvin probably came in to change the sort of culture to a certain extent and um, he wanted to know how much we wanted to be there, and if you didn't want to be there, you wouldn't have stuck it. You wouldn't have stuck it because the training was just, um, it was really, really ruthlessly tough, ruthlessly tough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, 100%. And I suppose it mages the players he's wearing, obviously it gave his great success over the years. And five votes for titles, obviously, Justin, and I suppose in the Picketer Powers, you had the likes of Tyrone, Mon, and Down, as you say, coming really good in them years, and obviously maybe ourselves. Great Derry, fans. of course, Derry, I didn't mention Derry. Derry, we Derry as well. As Derry in Scotland as well, of course, you know. Yeah, lots of good teams. And I suppose, um, Justin, when you're coming up against likes of Tyrone and various things like that, that's an absolutely brilliant preparation for the All-Ireland Series. Absolutely. Um, but we, we didn't think about preparation for the All Ireland series. So, um, I guess when we were starting off, we were there hadn't been too many Ulster game won in Ulster by Armagh for a number of years. So it was almost a novelty to actually win a game in Ulster, um, which is hard to believe now. Um, but uh, then putting putting two wins back to back, that was the next big challenge, which was a huge success for the team. And then actually getting over the line to win Ulster was enormous. Um, and playing against teams, you know, we played against Down. Down were the nemesis for me growing up, obviously having won 
All Ireland's in 81, 84, and you were my neighbour in county. I went to school in Down, so um, I had huge, huge uh, dislike. <laughs> dislike for Down, much more than Trum, would you believe? <laughs> Down were much more of the nemesis for us on the, the south side of the county than, than Trum, but then it then developed into Trum being that <laughs> in your years. But um, yes, we always wanted to just get, get a, a a string of wins in Ulster and get all the lines when our first Ulster night night nine was was huge, and um, but we didn't think about the Ulster campaign as being preparation for the All Ireland. We just thought of getting over the line in Ulster, and then we raised our sights on to the next level. Um, and probably undershot what we were capable of in ninety nine when we, we came up against Meath after a win uh, against Down in the Ulster final night nine and didn't do ourselves justice. And we could have won an All Ireland in ninety nine or two thousand, um, but. Uh, probably needed those experience with those defeats to to give us that um, ability in 2002 when we eventually got got there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose Justin, um, I obviously I was talking to Stephen McDonald there a couple of months ago, and he was just we were talking about the group, what the the winning habit, winning culture, the strength within the Armagh group, and so it was no better man to ask Justin what that 2002 All Ireland win just was unbelievable, serious scenes for the Orchard County, and I suppose if you want to kind of tell me about the group, the group morale, and I suppose that winning mentality that was instilled within you, Justin. Yeah, I think it was back to the type of training we did, the, you know, the toughness of the training we did together, and we all did it together. There were no shirkers. Everybody stepped up. Everybody, there was nobody uh, feeling injuries or saying, I'm not training tonight, or nobody not showing up tonight. Every player was there when, when the uh, the dirty training session was on, the tough, dirty, tough, tough training session was on. And plus, we we were very close in that group, and the closeness of the group was brought about by the management and the leadership. And the leadership was primarily from... Kieran McGinney. Now, Kieran McGinney is uh, heralded as being a great leader, a great captain, and a great uh, player on the pitch, and his steeliness, and his determination, and his toughness, and his um, ability to, to lead on, on the field was extraordinary. But something that, that's not seen and probably is not highlighted enough is well, his ability to bring the group together, to mm-hmm. form, to, to help that there be a sense of unity within the group where there was no favours, there was no cliques, there was no special bunches. We were all there. Every player was as important, and Geezer was instrumental in ensuring that happened himself and Quattle Rain, ensuring that every player on the panel felt that they were part of it and felt that they were valued and felt that they had a contribution to make. And um, through, uh, you know, that was brought about on number one on the training pitch, on traveling to games, meetings, uh, social events, um, of which in those days there were probably more of than the game, <laughs> right? Because as you say, it's a little bit more professional now, and that's just the way the, the game has developed. Um, but we were we were we were a close, very very close group, and we still are. And that was through that leadership from Kermuni, which was unseen but crucially important to get us over the line as a team in 2002 and before that and since. Um, and he's still doing the same as a as a manager for Armagh, and uh, it's an undervalued leadership trait, bringing everybody along with you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, shout it out. And I suppose we can touch on some of obviously the players you, you, you played with throughout your Armagh career in the early noughties. Oshie McConville, Stevie Mack, um, your brother Andy, yourself, Paul McGrain, Geezer, Tierney and Nets, he'd, he'd love to mention. Justin, some remarkable players. Oh, listen, they were exceptional players. Jamie Marshall was probably the best footballer I've ever played with. Um, just an extraordinarily powerful, poised um Unbelievable balance, unbelievable speed, unbelievable ball control, both feet, uh, a warrior, braveness, courage, um, gets big scores when you need big scores. Uh, Oshin McConville, uh, you know, the man you just want getting on the end of things and ha- who who got big scores, big times in so many different games at club and county level. Um, and like I remember doing the same at, at primary school level, would you believe? Um, you know, and Barry O'Hagan, Barry Duffy doesn't get mentioned enough. Uh, two McIntyres, Aidan O'Rourke, Campbell O'Rourke, who just lost out that year, who'd been consistently on the team for so many years. And to have you to have that that wisdom alongside you in the background, not necessarily getting big game time, but he got he got game time in 2002. So players like that, Jerry Reid, um, extraordinarily tough footballer, uh, missed out in 2002 through injury probably, and probably to my benefit. If Jerry Reid had been fully fit in 2002, I might have played. Um, and I think, I think, uh, 
Jerry, Jerry, Jeremy deserves massive credit for that because he wouldn't, even though he possibly got chances to play, but he wasn't fully fit. He told managers stick with Justin, stick with Justin, and that was a big, big thing for him to do as a man, and um, to uh, put the the good of the team ahead of his own personal ambition. I think that's something extraordinary about says so much about Jerry. Hooley as well was there and thereabouts. Um, our end it was as good a man marker as, as you've ever seen in the game. And um, I don't see that because he's my, he's my brother, because he was. Francie Bellia was as, as tough a man marker who was, who was time hit, time hit better than any man you ever did see. Andrew McCann, extraordinary football geezer, what can I say? Paul McGrain, uh, John Toll. I, you know, I hope I'm not leaving the NBA, out, but I am, of course. But you know, these these were all exceptionally good footballers, and I'm very, very lucky to have played with them. I'm very, very lucky to call every one of my friends, and people who I could trust, Roland Clark, people who I can call on any day, Stephen McDonald. Extraordinary footballers, extraordinary guys, great friends, and I could uh, trust them with my life, every one of them. Yeah, yeah, and a, a great thing to still have throughout this day and to, to this present day, of course, as well, Justin. I suppose leadership, Justin. Um, Kieran McGee, obviously yourself, and the great leaders for the Army Armagh teams over the years. And I suppose, do we see many kind of men like even yourselves and Kieran McGee around these days? Um, like, is it kind of gone very kind of team orientated? Like, do we see the likes of maybe Michael Murphy maybe steps out as a big leader these days, Justin? But we don't, we don't see too many Kieran McGinnies and McNulty, just McNulty's around these days. I, I think that's probably a bit premature to say that. Michael Murphy, you'd have to put him down as one of the great leaders in Gaelic football of all time. I think he's an extraordinary leader. Um, I think there are extraordinary leaders in the RMA team currently, and there are players who have that ability. And maybe in 10 years' time, we'll look back and say what a leader he was. And I think there is that capacity within the RMA team right now. I can say that about multiple other counties as well. Um, well, I think I think the commitments, the demands now on modern day intercounty players is extraordinary. And for those guys to give that commitment, it's I think that demonstrates leadership from every one of them, because the time spent on a weekly basis uh, preparing to be the best they can be for for their county on a, any given Sunday, any given Saturday, even is is extraordinary. And I think they deserve massive credit for that. Before any performance, they deserve massive credit for the level of commitment they are given. As amateur players, which is way above and beyond probably what we did in our team, um, and I think that's that's something that needs that needs to mentioning. Um, I, again, you, you can't really say how good of leaders how good the leaders are right now until you know, until they're probably through their more further into their careers, and I think yeah, that's it's unfair to judge them as such at this time. But Michael Michael uh, um, in Tony God obviously is he's 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 stepped up and delivered. On so, on so many big, big occasions already, so uh, we can give him that accolade already. I think. <laughs> like yeah, much. yeah, yeah. I think we, we give him that accolade since the moment he kicked, start kicking the ball for Donegal. He's been absolutely tremendous over the years, and I suppose setting standards, setting high standards. Well, just, that, go back, just go back to Michael Murphy. Such such a gentleman that guy yeah. is, and such a humble man in company. In any in any company, you wouldn't think he, he's Joe Ordway in any company, and that's such a huge sign of a, of a great, great, the great character that he demonstrates. I think that's what's been brought through. Jim McGinnis obviously created that culture in Billy Gall has been brought forward by uh, current management. And I think you know, that's something that's there's a lot to be said for. Uh, would you like to Mike or Mark Michael Murphy, Justin? <laughs> I do, absolutely. Phenomenal footballer, phenomenal fella. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And I suppose, Justin, you were referring to it, obviously, within your trainings and like no one was going to let um, cut any corners. So how important is it to set high standards, Justin, to get over the line, maintain high standards, and I suppose win these Ulster titles, win these All-Irelands? Because, Justin, at the end of the day, if you're not putting in the work, you'll not get the results. Well, that's, that's the fundamental. Um, and without the high standards, you don't, you don't win big games. Uh, you don't develop as a team. You don't develop... Uh, your true competitive edge, and you're you're not gonna you're not gonna when it comes down to the white heat of battle when uh, the game is in the melting pot. i um, sorry for the for the the metaphors here, but it's, it comes down to the preparation, and it's all about preparation. If you haven't done the preparation diligently and professionally, then you won't you won't cut it when when it comes to judgment day on the pitch. When the when the SH one T's hit the fan and you need to pull pull the performance or pull a big play out of the, out of the bag, it won't happen if you haven't done the work, if you haven't prepared properly for it. Um, and the standards that are set come from the management and the culture they create and, and the environment they create, the high performance environment they create. 
um, but ultimately it's down to the character of the players on the pitch and the, their willingness to contribute to that culture and to put, step up in terms of their effort and their professionalism at every opportunity. Um, that's how, how you go places and players who don't do that, or teams don't do that, they don't win. Simple. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and obviously referring back to the All Ireland title win in two thousand two, just in tremendous scenes and everything that went with it. But I suppose, like, obviously you've you've fond fond memories, and next year it's coming up to twenty years ago. So just outrageous scenes, and like we were talking to some teams, even like the likes of Kerry, Dublin, terrific teams back then. So what was it like to even kind of come up against the Kerrys and Dublins of this world, just in that the peak of their powers? Listen, I was a young boy uh, growing up with Kerry, the golden years in the 80s, uh, worshipping Jack O'Shea. I can remember getting Jack O'Shea's autograph with the centenary action sex exhibition in 1984, if you believe, it was one of my earliest memories. Um, having, having been in the Armagh dressing room with my dad, my dad was the coach of the Armagh, Father Hegarty and Peter Maycomb, um, being in the Armagh dressing room before the league final in 85, you know, seeing that environment up, up close as a young boy, uh, Remembering the, the team talks and the team talk before and after, the, 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 it wasn't too pleasant afterwards. Um, and just uh, worship to worship the great Dublin teams, worship the great Kerry players, as I said, the likes of Jack O'Shea, Pat Spillan, Maggie Shee, and to to play against those teams as a as an Armagh senior footballer was exceptionally uh, rewarding and it was, it was a huge honour and it was dreams come true stuff simple as that it was dreams come, it was dreams who come true to pull on the orange jersey in a league game against in Louth in 1985 and then to play at Dublin the very, very next game as Dublin reigning all Ireland champions rolling into the fairgrounds on a, I think on October Sunday a bright Sunday autumn evening and for us to beat the all Ireland champions as a, in a league game in my second game for Armagh Extraordinary, Mark and Paul Clark, uh, an All Ireland winner, a, a superstar, and then we've just beaten them in, in, in a league game, which was it was extraordinary. It was just, uh, it was overwhelming the the joy that brought, the excitement that brought, the, the sense of uh, fulfilment that brought. The, you know, the boyhood dreams come true. It was just extraordinary. I felt very, very privileged and very, very thankful to Brian McAllen for to have given me the opportunity. I'm thankful to every coach and player who I played along with all the way up and. Um, who helped me along the way to, to become the footballer I became. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I suppose Crow Park, third week, third week, third weekend in September, Justin, All Ireland final, piping hot day, the best day of your life. It was, of course, it was, it was unbelievable. It was, uh, you know, that was the real, the real dream come true stuff. You can't, okay, you know, the, the euphoria we experienced after the euphoria I experienced personally, the final was that game was, I, I can't begin to describe it. Um, and the whole occasion, the whole build-up, it was phenomenal. The, the 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 support from the fans in Armagh, it was just it was bonkers. It was crazy. It was uh, carnivals, you know, Brazilian carnivals. You know, every road was adorned with bunting. It was uh, cars. People were painting their cars in orange and white checkers. People were buying cars out of bangers to do up as Armagh cars. The jerseys, the fans, the the um, excitement was just unbelievable. And Whilst we had to sort of retract from that and not really involve ourselves, it was still you, you still couldn't not uh, see it and feel it. Um, the anticipation for the game was extraordinary, and the build-up was extraordinary in terms of our our in-house build-up in terms of what Joe did to get us right for that game. Um, you know, Sean Boylan and uh, get him in after a quiet session in Dundalk and uh, waking up in the morning of the match and getting a letter on the door from Muhammad Ali. It was. Uh, Extraordinary, actually, and the, the night before that game, I couldn't sleep. I was out walking around on the golf course in, in City West at three in the morning, um, and then waking up the next morning and getting that letter from Muhammad Ali, and then getting on the bus and the, the feeling driving through the streets of Crow Park with the Armagh supporters, the Armagh supporters going helter skelter, and uh, you know, also after the guard, in the guard escort, it was it was just phenomenal. It really was phenomenal. Walking out that pitch, uh, the the sense of um, nervousness and butterflies and excitement and anticipation that you know you, you can't you can't replicate that feeling ever and the when the when the ball is thrown in then being in battle mode and preparing being you're doing your job doing your job in the, that's a uh, cauldron the cauldron that's what because it was some cauldron that day um it was nip and tuck it was competitive it was as competitive as you can get and uh, every every play was crucial and for us to come out the right side at the end of the game it was Unbelievable, unbelievable. Experience of a lifetime, best day of my life, no doubt. 
yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. And of course, guys, this podcast is sponsored by yogaretro.com. Use my promo code JMF Podcast to get 15% off on their website. Um, you referenced a magnificent letter you got from Muhammad Lee, the late great Muhammad Lee, probably one of the greatest sports people ever, um, Justin, and uh, a word on that and what it meant to you is that day. Um, well, Hugh Campbell and Daisy Jennings were our sports, probably our, our performance psychologists or high performance coaches, and they've done a lot of work in terms of uh, the music that was you know, part of the, the team playlist. Uh, a lot of the PowerPoint presentations after our team meetings where there was video clips and um, a lot of the Ali stuff was used in the, the video clips in terms of the, you know trying to hone in on some element of what Ali did and his his, his own personal. Um, resilience and toughness and, and uh, ability to perform in the big moments. And that was all used to help us get, get insight into how to raise our own performance. And uh, I can remember one specific video clip about Ali talking about being on the ropes against Borman. He, he'd done the rope up in the, the, the rumble in the jungle. Um, and he talked about looking at the, you know, looking at the whites of, eye, whites of the eyes of Borman. And that's, that's what we, we I sort of use often is you know it's that time when you know you're you're looking at the whites of the days with your competitor and you know there's only you and him and, and you're the man you're marking and this, I saw it as that duel it was a duel between me and my man always and that was very um, inspiring but then to have with no no inclination whatsoever of this letter coming out of the door on All Iron Sunday um it was just such a such a, an enormous lift for a for a world uh, champion like Muhammad Ali a hero an Olympic champion one of the greatest sporting icons of all time in any sport to have a personal letter from from that man coming on your door in Ireland Sunday, extraordinary, such a lift, such a lift. Now that wasn't the reason why we won the All Ireland, of course, because all the other pieces would be put in play, but certainly it was a boost. It was a big, big boost. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and absolutely terrific memory to have, Justin. And I suppose um, the great man, uh, Joe Kernan, father of um, Aaron Kernan, the um, former Armagh player, of course, as well, and. Justin, um, a word on the, the great man that is Joe and uh, flinging medals at walls. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, that was. Um, I think different players with different memories of that that moment. Um, I certainly felt it was very powerful, very powerful. It, it's definitely it resonated strongly with me, um, and I can remember it vividly. And I didn't know what what, what was coming or what was what was the. Um, the purpose of where, where he was going with it but certainly it had an impact on me and uh, it, it was sort of no holds barred for the second half this guy can give it her all and I think it, it, it impacted our performance because the second half performance was phenomenal in terms of the work rate of the team all of the pitch and the big plays that were delivered by by uh, crucial crucial players and um, it was for me it was a big big impact um but simply what what Joe did was he he had his plaque from the '77 final in in, in uh, I guess Dublin, where they limped limped to a bad defeat, uh, to, say, to say the least. And he held it up and boys, is this is this what you want? But you actually put it around into your eye. Is, it, is that what you want? You want one of these? And he said, yeah, I can tell you what you can do with this. And smashed it into the rings. And then he got Eamon Michael, his uh, trusty lieutenant, handed him. Uh, all iron and gold and all iron winners medal. I said, hey guys, do you want one of these? So I put it held around and in, in their eyes, put it up to our face in their eyes, around every player in the dressing room. Do you want one of these? If you want one of these, you're gonna to to go out and fight for you're gonna go out and do your damn go out and perform here and work as hard as you've ever worked for your life and that's what we did. Yeah, yeah, definitely another shout out and I think we we see in so obviously games returning and obviously match preparation, Crow Park, everything that's happened in the last couple of years, Justin. But obviously the Erasmus has the high pressure situations, eighty odd thousand fans at Crow Park, forty odd thousand fans in uh, Clonus as well, Justin. So how did you kind of deal with all maybe that pressure during the week? Obviously I know you and yourself, you and Enda would have been dealing with a lot of it, but I suppose did you kind of any have any different um, match preparation or I suppose how did you handle all the nerves going into these big occasions? Um, well, I, I, I had a routine which I uh, completed diligently before in advance of every big game. Every game for a man, in fact, where I would write down uh, match scenarios, every match scenario that I anticipated being involved with, I'd write down, I would I'd lay down the floor with, with a notebook and uh, a cushion on my bedroom floor and I'd write down, write down and go over it and rehearse in my mind's eye, close my eyes and see it in my mind's eye and visualise it. 
Um, so that when match day came around, it's as if it's as if I'd been there before. I had it rehearsed in my mind's eye so many times. Um, and nerves, nerves are good. Nerves. Uh, I've, I've said this to so many teams um, and for so many big games. Nerves are a sign of your, your. It's important to you, and they're also a sign. You tell you, it's a sign your body's ready to go. That's the way I look at nerves, and I think that's important. And the pressure that you feel as a intercounty player. It's a bit what James Kerr, I actually got his book, Legacy. I went to a, a um, event with him a few years back and he had the book Legacy, which which chronicled the All Blacks' success. Um, and I asked him to inscribe a little note on the on the inside of the book where the sign is. And he says, the words he wrote were, pressure is a privilege. And that's that's something I, I embrace. It's a concept I embrace, and, uh, not just in football, but I think when you're in that position and the pressure's there, enjoy it because... There's lots of other people love to have that person you have. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, Justin. I suppose. What was it like to kind of be part of? I know we kind of said it at the start, but what was it really like to be part of that kind of winning culture, winning habits, hard training, being being part of such a like winning habit as well, Justin? Because that's going to bring you on as a person, a football footballer, and as an athlete as well, Justin. Probably led you to career, led you to the career you're having today. Um, I think it was it was a. It was a privilege, it was an honour, um, and it was testament to, to the character of the guys who I played with uh, at club level, uh, in Mullaban, uh, at school level, in the Abbey, um, at Queen's, in Belfast, um, and Armagh, of course, there was great, great, great characters. Um, uh, but fundamentally, what made the Armagh team so strong was it wasn't, it wasn't just 15 great players, there were 15 competitors, and more so, there were 25, 30 competitors. They were really, really competitive guys. Who in a one of in 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 the sprints, in 25 meter sprints, these guys would break their necks to try and win each sprint. Everyone. That's that's the, the level of competition in training sessions. Um in in grids, in in uh, small sided games, in any sort of the any of the drills, the competitiveness between players was extraordinary. It was always you had to be at your best to try and compete in the training session. And then that, that obviously carried through to the big games and that, that was probably the, the biggest fundamental ingredient to the success was the competitiveness and the character of the players that I played with and uh, I'm very very fortunate very feel very lucky to have played with those guys. Yeah, yeah 100% 100% and obviously 2005 came uh, knocking around Justin and um, obviously you represented the Armagh footballers from 95 so you gave it a, a, like an amazing stint. What was the uh, competent factor for uh, Justin McNulty to hang up the Armagh boots? Um, well, it was just I was ten years, ten years into my career, and uh, I had actually not been making the team for the last three years, and um, it was just time probably for me to move on. Um, I thought I'd given it a long, a long uh, commitment. You know, ten years as an independent pop was a huge commitment, and I was living in Dublin. I was, it was, it was taking a lot of me traveling up the road just before. I think that actually, actually that's the motorway had just been built. Um, and probably was grateful for for the years that I had spent. And uh, my Joe, staff and Joe, and took myself and Joe talked and just decided that, that was time to hang them up. And it took me about five years to recover from it. It took me about <laughs> five years to be able to go to the Armagh game and enjoy it. You know, it was such a such a gaping chasm in my life, a huge void that could not be filled. Um, and uh, it was like losing a loved one almost. You know, um, and uh, but now, now I'm back to being an Armagh fan, back to really, you know, enjoying, loving going to Armagh games as an Armagh fan, like I was, first of all, like so many other people, and um, grateful for the years that I did get with Armagh, and really hoping that other players would get the enjoy the success that I got to, to enjoy, because it's, it's a special, special feeling to have. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose so it's, it's interesting to kind of hear that as well. Obviously, we retired players and we're seeing so many retirements in the last couple of months in the current intercounty game and a lot of Dublin lads stepping away. So, Justin, I suppose, how did you fill that void? How did you fill maybe that Friday evening, that Tuesday evening, like obviously with your club? But, you know, a county commitment with Armagh, it was a special feeling for them 10 years, I suppose. Yeah, you just couldn't fill it. It's a void that can't be filled. It still has me filled. It will never be filled. And I still, I still miss it. I still miss that cutting thrust of the big battles, I still missed that burning, that lung burn in the in the first five minutes of the championship game where you're thinking, Jesus Christ, I can't go for the next ball, I'm going to go for the next 65 minutes. Um, it's it's uh, something that can't be replaced, but you just, you just try, it went into management obviously straight off after 
after my playing days finished um, with Armagh and uh, that was a big distraction for me and was a huge help um, and I got huge fulfilment from management but management is never, you can never replace stepping across the white line as a player and management's the next best thing I guess and that's how I, I focus, that's where I try to place my focus after my playing days with Armagh finished and obviously continue as a club player as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I was out and in the following year, 2006, you uh, took the reins in uh, Cavan, Mulhorn. You won a senior championship with them, of course, and obviously come to Cavan, probably one of the greatest moves of your life. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was a hugely rewarding experience, hugely challenging experience. And the lads will tell you, it wasn't it wasn't plain sitting that year. Um, we had plenty of big battles and plenty of games that were nipping tuck and could have gone either way, but it was uh, hugely developmental for me as a as a as a manager, as a coach. As a person, it was a, it was a um, really really rewarding experience. I'm very very grateful for having that, had that opportunity. No other already kiddo would has left to answer for, but um, really really enjoyed working with that team and um, every team I've worked with as a manager, hugely hugely rewarding and hugely developmental as a as a manager, coach, and as a person. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose in 2006, um, you definitely had the likes of Gown and Cavan Gales and everyone at the peak of the power. So I suppose how competitive did you find the Cavan Team Championship when you were taking over the reins with Mulhorn? I can't see listening to you nothing about the Cavan Senior Championship. Um, Paul Bill had been the manager with me with, with uh, Mulhorn beforehand for a couple of years, three years before, I think. And he'd been, they'd been knocking the door as uh, county finalists in the previous three years. I think, um, and so they were there or thereabouts. So I can't take any great credit for having brought any Midas touch or anything. I think it was probably just the team was due its due its day, um, and thankfully we got over the line. Uh, but it was a very competitive championship. We could have we could have lost any game at, at, during on a run to that success, um, but luckily luckily we came out on top. Um, and the team the team worked very hard. The team worked did a lot of serious serious hard work uh, in the build up to to that uh, success. Um, I can remember doing, you know, I was, I had to take the Dublin sessions in the early part of the year and uh, boys did a lot of work in Phoenix Park with me, the Dublin based boys. Um, and it was, there was huge commitment from the, from the team and given, given the pain that they've been through, they've experienced after having lost three, three, three back to back for, the, for them to keep going, keep knocking the door. I think that's a testament to those lads' character as well and um, thankfully good over the line. Yeah, and I suppose, as you said, uh, Justin, as well, when you finished up in 2005, you made a very quick jump into management. So I suppose when you did take over the reins, obviously with a cab club, Mother Horan, how, what did you make of it all? I suppose, like, the difference from playing to managing now, and I suppose you were, you were calling the shots, essentially. Yeah, well, listen, it's a huge step up. I, I, I never even contemplated getting into, going into management after football uh, as, as a, uh, a player. Um, and randomly, this gentleman, Noel already, kiddo, just gave me a call. I think he was working with Enda. Enda was involved with the Bally Bowden Club at the time in terms of coaching officer or a couple of years previously. Um, and they had built up, stepped, or created a relationship and uh, Noel was looking for a manager. I think Enda said to him randomly, why did you ask our just? <laughs> so that's how, that's how my management career started. Um, so having had no experience in management whatsoever to win to manage a, a senior club team, it was a baptism of fire. Um, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't plain sailing at all. In many, many manner of means, and the the cabin, the Mullinhorn lads will tell you that they probably recognised that I was a novice, but they, they stuck with me and they came along with me, and um, we 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 worked worked it worked it well in the end. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and uh, obviously you would have been uh, managing the great uh, Eddie Riley as well. So he, he was a very uh, nice, calm fella. <laughs> Eddie was feisty, feisty, and Kieran the roller as well. They were feisty to say the least. Yeah, 100%. But you probably put manners on Justin O'Day. Maybe you marked him in training once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never participated in training sessions, but I just told him what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and in the following year, uh, Justin, you took over the reins at um, St. Bridget's Club in Dublin. So how did you find all that? Oh, it's been great. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, Declan Bonner, uh, or Kevin Bonner, um, sorry, and Barry Cahill and... Heather Andrews and Paddy Andrews, you know, great, great players. Um, Ken Darcy, Declan Darcy just retired. Uh, great, great players and uh, big club, huge club, huge ambition. And we actually got the county final that year against uh, St. Vincent's and we had a chance to win it the last few minutes where a uh, goal chance was missed and St. Vincent's then went on to win all Ireland. So, uh, but a great team, a great, great experience. And, you know, obviously it was a hugely competitive championship in Dublin, as is always the case and uh, 
great, great experience and great, great learning experience and great, hugely developmental. Um, but I know I've worked with players that did work and work with and learned a lot from them and um, really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then after that, you went in uh, to be a selector with the Armagh Senior Footballers as well. So you, you came back into your own. And I suppose, how did you find that being a selector with the Armagh Senior Footballers as well and playing any uh, trick of the trade you would have gave over the years? Um, it was brilliant, brilliant. Uh, I would say I was still a, a novice and probably wasn't, didn't merit the, the position that Paddy uh, O'Rourke entrusted with me, myself and Donald Murder, where there was assistant signs. Probably was not at the level of coaching prowess that I needed to be at to be at high level at that time. Um, but learned a lot and uh, thankful for having that, had the opportunity with Paddy. And probably the players will recognise that I didn't have that coaching ability at that time, uh, the coaching capacity that maybe was necessary at an inter county level. Um, and um, I'm sorry I didn't, but it's it's you, you live and learn. Um, but it was hugely, hugely development, ex- development experiences as all experiences are in football. And um, but thankful for it. And you know, we we had a few big games, a few big moments, um, and could have been more successful. You know, great players, players who have played along with myself. Uh, uh, the team were just unfortunate, maybe not to have got over the over the line on a few of the big games. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I suppose the, the last job maybe before you finish up was the uh, Leash senior football job that came knocking around as well, Justin. So, so how did you find that? And maybe probably the di- dynamic of playing in the Leinster Championship as well, obviously against the Mighty Dubs and various bits and pieces. But how did you find maybe playing for Leash and maybe the kind of standard of football that it brought uh, to your life? Well, listen, I loved, loved the Leash job. Uh, again, great opportunity and um, hugely developmental for me as a coach and as a person, as a manager. Um, I got I got great mentorship through my time with Leash from a gentleman called Gary Keegan. I went to a sports tracker event, and you might, you might remember the sports tracker events in the City West, where uh, Loudman set the company up, and these were coaching uh, developmental um, series of, of uh, workshops in City West, and I think it was big money to actually attend, and. Went along to one of these ones, one of the events on a Saturday afternoon, and a guy called Gary Keegan was presenting. And Gary Keegan was the guy who's uh, probably singly responsible for the All Ireland, not the All Ireland, All Ireland in the head here, for the Olympic medals, uh, Carruth and McCullough. He he set up that system, that high performance system that developed, that produced those medals. And um, him and Billy Walsh worked together as the coaches. Or, or, sorry, but Gary was the team lead, um, and Billy was the coach, but. I saw him present and I thought, geez, this guy knows this stuff. This guy knows about high performance. This guy knows how to set up a high performance system. So I, I, I actually went to him. I queued up afterwards to get talking to him. I said, Guy, can I meet you for a coffee? And I met him for a coffee a few weeks later up at the High Performance Institute, the Institute of Sports High Performance Centre in, in uh, Blanchetown. And I was overwhelmed with the information this guy gave me. I was overwhelmed with what the, the insight he had into getting the best out of teams and building a high performance culture. And he guided me through my managerial days at leash and hopefully that that helped to bring something more professional that it would have brought otherwise I had not met Gary and um, obviously brought in Barry Solon who was hugely uh, advanced in terms of the um, S&C part and uh, the, Barry put first first step was he put in a gym a high performance gym in leash in, in the in the Moor Park and uh, the first few months we spent in that gym and getting the guys conditioned and that was Unbelievable in terms of you know when when they did go across the white line in the league they were I think they were head and shoulders above our teams who were behind that, in terms of that conditioning at that time I think we were probably one of the pioneers in terms of that high performance setup in terms of the gym there which Barry Sloan was spear spearheaded great players in the show obviously uh, Ross Molly Billy Sheehan uh, Brendan Quigley Kevin Meaney uh, so many good players Cara Haley um, MJ uh, you know. Great players who were really probably well established, um, and we probably didn't do ourselves justice in the Leinster Championship. Probably in the qualifiers, we got close. You know, in a couple of years, I think we we got beaten by Dublin narrowly, beaten by Dublin by an own goal. Dublin as Ireland champions in Crow Park. In my second year, and the following year, we got beaten by Donegal up in uh, Carrick and Shannon. And those games were competitive. And I think Donegal and Dublin were both will tell you both that we were there or thereabouts in those games, and they could have gone either way, and only for uh, a break of break of a ball, you know, we could have won those games. And um, so, brilliant experience. Uh, last, um, the, the last year was not uh, not as 
positive as it could have been because we had been promoted to Division One in, in after my first year, and then we didn't retain a Division One status when we got there. So, um, probably on the so the trajectory was not upwards. So we we moved on. We we parted ways, but I would have loved to have gone on with each for longer. Um, and have very very happy memories. Great great relationships down there still, and wish you know still still sort of semi sport leash team because of that because you know. Uh, very very fond memories of, of my involvement with Leash. Yeah, hundred percent, absolutely, absolutely. And I suppose we can touch on to your club as well, Justin and uh, Mark Bond. You uh, won won Armagh title with them and won Ulster title. And I suppose it's like anything else, Justin. We all know with this really successful Cross and Glen team in Armagh, so it obviously very very competitive up there and probably dominated by Cross and Glen. But obviously did tag on them two titles, Justin. I suppose um, what was it like to tag them on? Well, listen, we we. In '95, we had a wonderful year. It was a dream, dream stuff, you know, in terms of how it how it's progressed. Uh, we were very, very hungry, very, very sore, having been beaten by clans in the previous year in the championship, and uh, we had them in the first round. The draw pulled out clans in the first round, so we had a focus, and we were laser focused on clans. So we did look one game ahead of that, and um, things went right for us. Not day. I think they got a man sent off, and. Everything went right for us. Everything went wrong for us, and we won that game quite comfortably. And then uh, with a few big games, St Peters and Cross Glen we beat in, in, on the way to the final. and beat Harps in the final. Harps we didn't we didn't play against Harps in the final, and Harps didn't play either. So we just lucky get out over the line. And I remember after the following Tuesday night, the train uh, hadn't even thought about Ulster Club. This, this is probably a pretty relatively new concept for us as players. We're having even give it any consideration. And Peter McDonald's and so stood us all at the wall at the sleeve body inside of the pitch and Q Collins mother barn and uh, asked this guy is what, what do you think he's he's wanna leave it there, just coast through this also club or do you want to give us a crack? And we all collectively decided let's give this a crack and we did that. We carved in the first game I think we and then we had Castle Blaney and Sammy and then um Bailey were in the final um and uh, we just had a dream campaign really. We uh, had wonder wonder performance against Castle Blenny in the semi final in the marshes and uh, then Billy Bar we just blitzed them the first half and totally blitzed them. Uh, but at the end of the day we were lucky to get out there. The goal disallowed in the last minute of the game, which the referee blew the whistle up before the, the ball ended the net. So we were very, very fortunate. Um, and probably we, we had the ability to go on and win the Ireland because I can remember I can remember sitting at one of our you know, this the crazy thing is about the training sessions back in those days and, and I think in autumn ninety ninety four we were on the beach in uh, Clower Head or not Clower Head, Term Fagan. And uh, we used to do beach sessions and they were killer, killer sessions, Peter McDonald brought us down there for more more for the team bonding than for the science of the session, you know. And then we we go to the local pub, the Lily Finnegan's, for a few beers afterwards. <laughs> and I, I remember uh, one of the conversations we had was, uh, "Feck, Feck, Clan de Gale, bring on Nemo Rangers," you know. So Nemo Rangers were were the big team of the time, and that's we sort of had that belief about ourselves as a team that we had that ability to go and compete at that level. Um, although we, we weren't looking beyond kind of yeah, but that's that was a sign that we were had the confidence in ourselves and we, we had some great players, you know. We obviously something that's not recognized is the first the first four men in the parade in two thousand and two were more than men, you know, and that's that's not been done by too many other clubs, you know, and um that we, we, we are that we are that happened because of the team that we played with in Mother Band who had great, great players, great, great characters and great, great warriors, you know, Cody Burns, Raymond Quinns, the Colin McParlins, Neil Smiths, uh, Nippy Crawley's, Paddy McGinney, uh, Karen Grant, great, great players, Shane Collins, and they they brought us on as players, myself, and Karen McGinney, and then down to, um, Benny Tierney, and very, very thankful for having been involved in that team because we had wonderful times as, as a club and uh, we had success, relative success, but we we deserved probably more success. We we were very, very close to crossing down a number of occasions after that, and they just nipped us probably to uh, blame Ashing for a lot of it. Um, <laughs> and uh, we we were really, really competitive across and they can they'll tell you that themselves. Uh, the rivalry between Mulvan and Cross over in four or five years was just extraordinary. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And I suppose, Justin, the uh, current state of affairs, Arma obviously have retained Division 1 uh, status for an early year of great times. We see Kieran Donny involved with the Arma senior footballers and obviously Kieran McGinney 
leading the charge. So uh, what do you make of the current product and uh, will Dublin be stopped? Um, I think so. It's obviously it's ultimately it's gonna happen just as a matter of when. Um Kieran Donaghy and Kieran McKeever, they've brought something new and fresh into their match setup. You can see it. There's there's different vibrancy about the players this team. Um or sorry, this this year. Uh, and I think that's down to the, the contribution of both Kieran Donaghy Starr and Kieran McKeever. And it's, it's it was a I think a master stroke and it's where games are pulled that way out getting Donaghy involved, God knows. I know Kieran obviously has relatives in his people in Trome, I uh, will not mention that, but games uh, <laughs> are games when they've got Donaghy involved and carry on. I think that's hopefully it will be proven in time as being a master stroke, and that's not to, to add additional pressure to, to the team. I think they're they're capable, capable of shouldering that pressure, and I, I know they won't be looking beyond this game on Sunday. Um, but I'm excited about what Arma have as a, as potential as a group. I mean, as individuals, there's phenomenal talent, there's phenomenal ability. There's I think there's good character there as well, which is the most important trait. Uh, they've, they've uh, I think their willingness to do the work, and um, their willingness to fight for each other. I think that's that's exciting. And um, does that uh, guarantee success? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And they know they've got to do the meet and drink things to make to help them get over the line. And 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 any individual day, any given Sunday, they know they've got to do the simple things well. They know they've got to keep their free, their scoreboard free count down, concession rate down. They know they've got to get the get the create the high um, percentage opportunities. They know they've got to win their kickout battles. They know they've got to stop. Stop our team, keep, limit their their uh, capacity to to score and play and perform. I think Arma have the tools to go far, um, but they're not looking for beyond this weekend. Um, I'm excited about what they have as as potential, um, but they've got to deliver that potential because potential means Jack. You got to deliver that potential. You got to deliver that potential every day you go out. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. And I'm just interested maybe to hear your perspective on this as well. I think it was in, it was in the Donegal game there um, last year in the championship. I think uh, like Mike, Mike Murphy was on the ball. I think some of kind of, um, you know, players were just kind of celebrating in his face. But I think Donegal could have been winning by about 10 or 11 points, Justin. Would you be in support of that? Or what's the kind of like mindset on the Armagh lads carry on at that, correct? Listen, I don't think that was preconceived. I think that was just... Um... They were maybe a little bit overhyped on that day. That whoever was involved, I'm not going to uh, single out any players. That those 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 incidents happen in games, and I don't think that's something to judge a player by. Or, or you know, I think um, Arma are are champ at the bets going to go and deliver a performance. Last year, uh, the game against Donegal, there there's huge huge learnings from that. You know, in terms of behaviours, in terms of the performance, and the players will hopefully bring, you know store that up and learn from it and develop from it and bring it into our next performance. The next performance is all that matters, and that's the game against Antrim on Sunday. And the players will be willing to do themselves uh, to to return a bit of honour to themselves as a championship team, and that's got to be done by how they perform as a group on Sunday. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I suppose, Justin, are you enjoying maybe the current state of affairs? Obviously, like, I know Dublin's dominance and everything that goes with it, but I suppose are you enjoying the Ultra Championship? I know, obviously, Donegal did bet down by a lot of points there last weekend, but are you enjoying the current state of affairs um, as we speak, Justin? Oh, here I, I just I could watch football all day every day and um, I can actually see the marshes you look up the hill here from from my house I can see the marshes are view park as there is called now and um, from from uh, top of the hill here Um I love football I'm very very passionate about football I think it's the best sport in the world and even as current current guys I think that the tactics around the game now it's it's extraordinary the tactical uh, ding dongs that go on now in terms of how teams uh, match up. Um, the the skill levels of players now, the athleticism of them, the the, the systems, and um, the ability to take scores from every part part of the pitch, from every player. It's a different sport than I played, um, and it's it's a joy to watch it. I love the cut and thrust. But obviously, the, the game last weekend wasn't as competitive as you would like. So down probably don't feel it did themselves any semblance of justice. If that happens with games, and the down are not as bad as they looked, and Tr- and Donegal are certainly not as good as they looked probably on the game on the day. Um, but I think Dublin are, are there to be taken. Kerry looked like the most probable team to do it. Kerry are looking awesome. My God, they looked awesome in the last number of games I've seen them. Uh, they have unbelievable scoring capacity uh, from so many different positions. And it's exciting. I think this just this year's championship is just hugely exciting. I'm looking forward to getting back in to see the games. I'm hoping that that, that, that will be the case that we will we'll really get to see the all Ireland final this year in person. Um, and I'm hoping that. I'm supporting the team in Orange doing it, uh, but it's. I think the game is 
um, a wonderful place. I mean, there are naysayers about the, the way the sport has evolved. I think it's it's fantastic uh, how professional, how um, how skillful our players are, how conditioned our players are, and how professional they are, and everything but the end. Yeah, definitely. And uh, lastly, on it, uh, Justin, it's probably a year that anyone could really win Ulster. Like, there's a lot of informed teams. Tyrone, Donegal, they didn't have great league campaigns, but obviously Donegal had a great performance last week. Yourselves, um, Derry are absolutely fine at the minute. Rory Gallagher is doing serious work. Cavan have obviously kind of gone down the pecking order, but anyone could really win it this year, Justin. Yeah, well, listen, nobody, nobody was talking about Calvin last year, and Mickey pulled it out of the bag, and Mickey's a master motivator, and he will be using every everything at his, at his disposal to get that team back, um, and he, he no better man. Um, Derry, you'd have to say there's a huge huge potential there. Rory has done great work, and they seem to be on the on the way back, which has been too long since Derry have been competitive. I think um, Rory's done a good job, and they will, they'll be there or thereabouts. Uh, obviously, Donegal are out, out in front and will will take some beating. Trung will be competitive, of course, as always. Uh, so you know you can't rule out any team from any any given day can take any any team out, and so so too can Antrim. Um, so I think it's it's an exciting championship, um, and I'm not looking beyond Sunday for our match. Yeah, hundred percent, Justin, hundred percent. Um, brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. And I suppose Justin to uh, wrap it up, nice easy question for you. Um, who would have been the toughest player player you played against, and the best player you played with? Toughest player I played against. My God, I played against some tough ones. I can tell you, John Crowley, Kerry, Michael Donnan, John Donnan, sorry, Michael Donnan, Galway, uh, current Galway manager. What's his name? Power Joyce. Power <laughs> Joyce. Mark Power Joyce. We didn't have t- 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 we didn't have uh, kind words. <laughs> 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 Mickey Linden, my God, uh, Morris Spitz. Um, I've marked some great, great players in my day. My God, um, I, I'd be, it'd be hard. It's Gary, I've marked Gary, I've marked Trevor Giles. Um, Desi Farrell, Cosgrove. <laughs> I couldn't. It's very hard to think why. I always say is I've marked, marked really, really tough players to mark. And um, as to say on the chase, on the chase, Justin, I'll have to push you for an answer. <laughs> I think the hardest player we ever marked was John Crowley. Kerry. Yeah. Exceptional footballer. Exceptional footballer. I remember coming back from Lanzarote, our team holiday in ninety. Sorry, ninety nine. Or 2000, the year 2000, we're playing carrying the league down in Killarney and Morgan John Crowley. Um, you know, we got back off of the, the plane on from Lanzarote, I think, on the Wednesday evening, and we're playing carry that Sunday. And uh, to say John Crowley gave me the run, there, run around was an understatement. And that was back in the day when you didn't have that blanket defense, when you didn't have an extra cover. And I think he two goals scored in, in the first 11 minutes, and uh, I got I got the finger <laughs> from, <laughs> from Brian McGillan. And uh, I tell you what, I learned a lot. I learned a lot that day, and it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a headlight. But um, he was some player. And but as I said, there were many other hugely uh, talented and brilliant players played with. Play, players have played with. Um, you know, it's very hard to sing as a player out. And Geezer, Stephen McDonald, Clarkey, um, Paul McGrain, Jimmy Martin. I think the player who had most. You know, you, I, I can't. I can't say. Um, Forget about Oshin's, Oshin's ability to get big sports and big games was very, very evident from a very, very young age, and he's done that all through his career. But the player who had everything, I think, with every every facet of the game was Jamie Martin. Just an unbelievable footballer, unbelievable footballer, unbelievable fella, and uh, power, pace, poise, um, ability to get big scores. That score he got before half time in the All Ireland final in two thousand and two was massive. It was. Probably it's, it was it's a forgotten about score, but it was massive to keep Kerry within four. And if we had been in five points down, I don't think we would have pulled it out of the bag. But Jared, he fought for that score. He fought so damn hard for that score, and the character he showed him digging it out was enormous. And his contribution in terms of coming randomly for that kick out from Benny for the goal was massive as well. Um, Jared Martin, his best pound for pound footballer I ever played with. 100%. Very last one, Justin. Um, there's a young Justin McDonaldy trying to make the breakthrough across the country in Armagh, all across Ireland. What bit of advice would you give to maybe a 17, 18 year old lad trying to make the breakthrough onto a county panel or any walk of life? 
Um, dream big, work hard, and get a mentor. Super, super. 100%, 100%. Joseph McNally, thanks a million for joining me this week. And of course, this podcast is sponsored by yourgaretshow.com. Use the promo code JMAC podcast to get 15% off on the website. Justin, thanks a million. Pleasure, John. Thank you very much for having me on.